Well, uh, thank you, Matthew. Some of that's true. Uh, some of it. I'm Larry Johnson, an alcoholic. And, uh, and I'm privileged to be here. It's a real honor. Uh, some of you have known me for a number of years. Uh, and if you hadn't seen me in a year or so, you wonder what happened to that guy. Uh, a year ago, uh, this time of the year, uh, I was weighing in at around 195. And uh, I'm a long ways from that right now. And I'll just tell you, uh, I'm not going to talk about uh, that particular illness, but I've had, uh, I've been diagnosed with two fatal illnesses in my lifetime. Fatal without treatment. And the first fatal illness I was diagnosed with was chronic alcoholism. In 1972, uh, a doctor diagnosed me with chronic alcoholism. That was what was on my diagnosis sheet in the treatment center I was in. I didn't see that for a few months. I was sneaking around one day and and they let me volunteer there and I saw some client or patient files and I happened to look at mine and uh, I thought well this would be fun because I'm sure I was really a great patient and uh, after I read it I wished I hadn't read it. It wasn't all that great but I noticed the diagnosis and then uh, just shortly after Valentine's Day last year, I was diagnosed with, with cancer. And uh, if you don't get the treatment, yeah, you'll make it. So I'm, I'm all about treatment and uh, had lots of it, but I'm glad to be here. Uh, and God's been good. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about the I will tell you my story. It doesn't take long to tell it anymore. Well, if I tell the whole thing, we'd be here next week. But uh, I would, y'all wouldn't. I'd be here. <laughs> I, I, this room will start emptying around eight o'clock. Uh, it's amazing to me how well we care for each other and Alcoholics Anonymous. There is a stream or network of power that flows through Alcoholics Anonymous and through our members. And when one of the members comes on any kind of trouble, people rally to that. And that's always been my case. I remember about 20, a little over 20 years ago, I was in the hospital. They thought I'd have a heart attack, and fortunately it wasn't. And I thought, they said you're going to be here about seven days. And I thought, well, this would be a good opportunity to get some rest. But y'all wouldn't let me rest. Every time I looked up, one of you would be standing in the door. And I'm thinking, why don't you go home and let me get some rest? But they're not going to die and say that, but I thought that a couple of times. Uh, that's just the way we do things. And that's what members of AA do. Uh, the first group I ever went to, they had a sign on the podium that said, we care. And we, we care. And if we ever vacate that idea and we're going to be in a lot of trouble. We do care. And I tell you for the last 15 months I don't think a day has gone by that I have not talked with another member of our college knowledge. And we don't talk about me so much. We just talk. And that that's a powerful thing. That connection that we have. And, and, I'm, and I'm thankful for it. Uh, and I've, I've been involved in a lot of different things in AA. I've been placed in positions of leadership in Alcoholics Anonymous 
over the years from time to time. And obviously, I did okay with that. Uh, I was telling Tom uh, earlier this afternoon that I sponsored a guy, and I'm really not proud of this, because I sponsored this guy. And it, this shouldn't be this way uh, if I'm doing my job. He's, he's five years sober now, and he's working in a treatment center. And I have a problem with that. I used to work in one of them. I was a, a counselor. Went to school five days and got my papers. <laughs> so all you had to do it in the 70s. If you go to school five days and get a certificate, you were in. And, uh, but he was telling me that in his, the treatment center he works in, I was right in Texas, that they were trying to instill this concept of leadership into the clients in this treatment facility. And I listened as he spoke about that and that the kind of being critical of the clients that they would, they couldn't seem to grasp this idea of leadership. And the more I listened to him, and I can tell this because this is what I told him, I surmised that he knew very little about it himself. And it's hard to pass on something to someone unless you've got some real experience with it. And our, our book tells us that. Huh? And so I asked him, I said, do you, well, our first question I asked him was, have you ever read the AA service manual. And he hesitated. And then he started to answer me. I said, you hesitated. And that means that you haven't. And in our, in that, in that, in that service manual, in the ninth, the, the, the writings around the, the ninth concept, which is about leading some of the best stuff around leadership that I've ever read. And I told him, I said, if you read that, and then you take those ideas with you, and don't tell anybody where you found that stuff, and they'll think you're a genius. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, but it's so true. I know when I was elected alternate delegate in my area, I was, uh, it was firmly suggested to me that I read that every day for 30 consecutive days. And I did that. Uh, I can stand here and say that I have done almost everything I've been asked to do in AA. If I said done everything I've been asked to do, you'd think that I thought I was perfect. Uh, I can tell you, I've, I've, I've never not done what my sponsor has asked me to do. Now, I didn't do it when he asked me to do it, <laughs> but I ended up doing it because it was the right thing to do. I was born at a very early age <laughs> and raised in a Christian atmosphere about 35 miles south of here in a little mill village that's still called Cordova. And... Uh, I don't think that had anything to do with me becoming an alcoholic. Uh, there's a lot of them come out of there. There's a lot of, a lot of alcoholics come out of that little village. Uh, a lot of outlaws. Uh, a lot of guys I went to, grew up with uh, ended up in doing prison time. And we were all about half outlaw anyhow. Uh, and I had the privilege a couple of Sundays ago of having a, a visit with a guy that I took my first drink of hard liquor with. I stole that liquor from my daddy. And uh, on a Saturday afternoon, 
he'd come home from the, wherever he'd been, and he had a half a gallon jar of white liquor with him. And uh, I hadn't talked about this a long time. But Dad was, he was, a, he was a hard drinker. He was probably, my father was probably alcoholic. I mean, he, he looked like a duck, and he walked like a duck, and he quacked like a duck, and he was probably a duck. And, but I, when, he, when he got that thing home, I followed him in the house, and he took it out of the sack, and then he got an empty jar, and he got him a piece of meal cloth, and in that meal cloth, he opened up a pack of dried apples, and this guy, I mean, he was like a, a chemist or something working on this deal. <laughs> and he was very precise in, in his process. And he put them dried apples in that milk cloth, and then stuck it down into the empty jar, and he poured that liquor over them apples. Then he squeezed them, and he put them in the other jar, and he passed that thing back and forth probably three or four times until he got it the color that he wanted it. And what I came to understand later, he was doing that to take some of the steam out of it. And when he got done, he got him a water glass and he poured about that much in there. And I'm watching him, you know, I'm 14, 15 years old. And he took that glass and threw it up and just drank her down. And then he lost his breath. He was gasping for breath. And, he just, and his nose was running, his eyes were watered. And I thought, oh my God, he's going to die. Because I mean, I, I thought he was going to have a, a, some kind of fit or something. And finally, he was able to get his breath. And he said, whew. Boy, that's good. And I thought, man. If it's that good, you go through that much to get, get it. It must really be good. And uh, so when he went to take his nap, uh, he always took a nap about halfway down into that jar. He'd do, have to go take a nap. And uh, so when he took his nap, I funneled me uh, some of that liquor into a 12 ounce Pepsi bottle and carried it up to the store where we caught the bus for school. And then Monday morning, me and this guy that I met with two Sundays ago, cut hooky that day, and took that 12 ounces of white liquor down to the mill pond. And uh, the sun woke us up about three o'clock in the afternoon. Now, I was sharing that with Jim, and he said, you know, I seem like I remember something like that. Well, it doesn't seem to me like I remember it very vividly. And the reason I do is it didn't, it didn't have the same significance with him that it did with me. And he just barely remembered it. And I think our kind, has, we have a tendency to remember those things because they're events in our life. Uh, when I first came to Alcoholics Anonymous, my first sponsor, what did I ask me? You remember your first drink? And I said, yeah. And he said, you remember your last drunk? And I said, yeah, because I was just fresh off of it. And he said, don't ever forget your last drunk. I said, why is that important? He said, well, if you forget it, you might not have had it yet. And I thought, well, that's pretty hard, though. Uh, so I haven't forgotten it. Uh, I won't go into a whole bunch of stuff, but I'll tell you that I took that, that drink. I was, I, I think, probably 15 years old. And, and I quit drinking in 1959. On July the 5th, I quit drinking for the rest of my life. I made a conscious decision and a solemn oath to myself, to my parents, 
and to anyone that would listen to me that I had had my last drink. And I honestly believed what I was saying. And I didn't drink anything for three years. And it's probably the most miserable three years of my existence up to that time. I don't know if you've ever lived like that. Not drinking, but wanting to. Not drinking, watching others drink. And knowing what, what's happening with them. And, and I just, it was just miserable. During that three years, I met a girl, we got married, uh, and set out on this marital bliss that we had anticipated that didn't quite turn out to be bliss. Uh, I was talking to a lady today about that, and I said, There's, there is such a thing, and I believe this, you don't have to believe it, but I believe it, there is such a thing as two people not being able to cohabitate under the same roof. They just, two people, we were two people that just couldn't operate under the same roof. And as a result of that, we weren't able to stay married. Uh, we stayed married five years and we fought a lot. She did most of the fighting. She was, a, she was a fighter, a uh, mean, mean woman, a uh, little bitty gal, 5'2", weighed probably 110 or 15 pounds, had a right cross like Joe Lewis. Uh, and, and she'd hit you, she would hit you, and she hit me a lot. And I mean, seemingly without provocation. Uh, I mean, I, I, I don't think I'm unique, unique in any fashion, but I could possibly be one of a handful of guys that's ever been hit with a meatloaf. <laughs> now, the meatloaf doesn't make a lot, it doesn't do a lot of damage, but man, it makes a mess. <laughs> This girl was making a meatloaf. I said something she didn't like, and right in the face, I it was meatloaf. Well, hurt my feelings. I went and got my clothes and went to my mama's. Uh, I'm such a macho dude. It usually hurt it goes to mama. It was, every time somebody left, I was always leaving. And I went to the only place I could go was to my mama's. And uh, then I'd come back and we did that for as long as we could stand it. We didn't fight all the time. We had two children <laughs> in that marriage. And so we did. We had some timeouts. Uh, that's what's the good. There's good in every situation that seems bad. There's always good. I look for the good. And the good that came out of that marriage was certainly those two kids. They're both successful in their own right. And if you, and I'm talking, I'm not talking about financially. Uh, one of them is very successful financially. And because she works hard, I watched her. She's been on the same job since 1986. And I've watched this girl put in more than one 12 or 14 hour a day. And hard work pays off. And I've had, that's been my experience as well. And my son has uh, had some problems with his doing. And I don't know any dad that wouldn't be proud to say this. But he's doing good now. He's doing good now. Uh, and, and I'm proud of him. And <clears throat> Zach and Betty and I separated. Uh, we, it wasn't a planned separation. I just got tired 
of my situation. It just didn't seem like, it, well, it wasn't working. And I got up one morning and packed a suitcase and got a ride up to US 220 and called a ride to Greensboro to get a job in Greensboro. I was in the retail furniture business. And I interviewed with a company there in Greensboro. Uh, it actually was a, one of the, I wasn't looking for a manager's job, but they were looking for, looking for a credit manager and a salesman. They doubled those positions and, and I knew I was qualified to do that. And uh, after the interview, I felt good. Felt good after the interview. I knew I had interviewed really good and uh, I wasn't drinking that day. And uh, as a matter of fact, I don't think I'd had anything to drink. I was on my second forever. I've had two forevers. The one in 59 and then another one at Christmas in 62. And that was the second time that I quit drinking forever. And so anyhow, I was in one of those forever bills. And when, like I said, when the interview was over, I thought this is God did good. And I knew I did. And I'm thinking, if, if they're going to hire anybody, there's no reason they shouldn't hire me. I meet, I meet all the qualifications. And the guy pushes back from the desk, and he said, Larry, uh, I really like what you had to say. And you qualified for the job. But I got one other question that I have to ask you. And this was not on his interview sheet. And I said, well, what's that? He said, do you drink? And I said, no. And he said, good. Well, I knew that. Because the first time I sat on the porch swing with Betty at her granddaddy's house, she asked me that question. She said, do you drink? And I said, no. Because I had just entered into that first forever. And I said, no. And she said, good. And I just thought, that's it. That's my answer. I've been looking for the right answer for that question for a few years. Because <laughs> people would ask you that. And I didn't, I didn't him haul around. Well, a little bit. How much? Well, you know. And uh, never would really come clean with them. And I found this, uh, this no suited everybody. I mean, it was a one size fit all answer. And because if somebody would ask you that question, they got a reason for asking you that. Somebody has given them some trouble behind drinking or they wouldn't be asking the question. And I figured that out. And the guy said, good. And then I said to him, why did you ask me that question? He said, well, the guy that you're going to replace in our company is an alcoholic. And I could tell he didn't like him. <laughs> and he said, and we are not hiring any more of those. And I said, I don't blame you. I wouldn't, I wouldn't have one of either. He didn't ask me, but if he had, I, gave, I got to give him about half a dozen good reasons why we shouldn't, we wouldn't go be hiring no alcoholics to work in our company. <laughs> so I go to work for this guy over in Berlin, and I'm about six months into this. Betty has got a lawyer, and I'm out. I'm, on, I'm, I'm out of that deal, and uh, things really aren't too good on the domestic front for me, but I'm doing good on the job. And one Saturday afternoon, Ed come out on the floor and he said, we're going to close early today. And J.B. and Will have gone to the liquor store and to get a bottle. And we're going to have a little drink to close the business 
So why don't you stop by the office and have a drink with us? And I said, well, you know, I don't drink. He said, I know. I know that. And he said, come by about 5.30 and have a drink with us. And I thought, well, maybe he didn't hear me. So I said, you know, I said, I, don't. I said, hey, you know, I don't drink. He said, son, I know you don't drink. We just don't have a drink. And I said, oh, okay. <laughs> That's all we're going to do. <laughs> but for the next two hours, that's all I could think about. Everybody else went about their business. They're not thinking about what's going to happen at 5.30, but I can't get it off my mind. By the time 5.30 got there, I'm ready to go party. And I walk in the office, and I'll set the scene for you real quick, and then I'll leave it. There's, there's the desk in Ed's office, and there's Ed, there's Ed and J.D. and Will, and a chair for me and some cups and some ice and some juice and the bottle. And I looked at that bottle and they had bought a pint. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm thinking, what are we going to do with this? A pint. And I'm doing, I immediately did the math on the pint. <laughs> And I'm the, I'm the guy in the room doing the bath. I always did the bath. I was never concerned about the drink in my hand. It was where the next one was coming from. And will this be enough? If you thought like that, you might be alcoholic. There's a good chance. You ever go to a liquor store to get a bottle of booze and walk out with a sack full? I mean, it was like, I had to get one of those, you know. Now I got a sack full of booze. I've done it more than once. But anyhow, I do the math on this booze, and, and we knock that bottle out. And the upshot of that was when it was all said and done, is Ed got in his car and went home to his family. I didn't follow him, but I know he did that, because he always did that. And J.D. and Will got in their cars, and they went on to their family. And I didn't follow them either. But I'm confident they did that, because they always did that. And I left for California, because <laughs> that's what I do. When I drink, I leave town. Uh, I have left town more than once. Uh, things could be going fine, but boy, once we started that, you know, I, I looked around that day and I thought, I never liked, I never liked this job. I don't even know why I took the job to start with. And I don't like, I just don't like anything about this. That was right after a guy asked me if I wanted to go to California. And I said, yeah. He said, you ever been to California? I said, no, but I always wanted to go. And I hadn't really given any thought, but he brought it up. But I was the kind of guy that I was an easy target for the power of suggestion. You bring it up, I'm in. I sat in a bar in Fort Worth one Saturday morning. I was supposed to be at work. I had gone to breakfast. And uh, a guy said, have you ever been to Mexico? And I said, yeah. It's not unusual for people in Texas to go to Mexico. And uh, he said, when's the last time you was down there? I said, I don't remember, but I can tell you now it's been too long. <laughs> and he, I said, we ought to go. He said, we should. I ordered two six-packs to go. And I got him, and I said, come on, let's go. He said, go where? I said, I thought we was going to Mexico. He said, well, I didn't mean today. I said, well, I'll see you when I get back. And I went and didn't tell anybody. It was gone through. I just do stuff like that. So we head to California, and I can't wait to get to California because it's going to be wonderful out there. I just knew it. And uh, I could see myself walking on the beach, 
or sitting on the beach contemplating my life and going through the process of what we were all doing in the mid-60s of finding myself. We were all trying to find ourselves. Nobody got anywhere, but we were looking hard. And that was just going to be wonderful. I had a plan, always had a plan. I would be gone two months is what it would take. Uh, I would find myself, I'd get a job in California and make a pile of money because I heard they made a lot of money out there. And then I would come back over to North Carolina and I'd go see Betty and my two children and explain to them what had happened and give them some money and make everything okay. Because you see, I thought that that made everything okay. It, it doesn't. Money, the only problem money solves is money problems. And two months, I figured, would do it, as I said. Well, two months go by, then six months go by, and then a year and then two, and I'm stuck in the Dallas-Fort Worth area of Texas. I was got in the car business selling cars, making a lot of money. I uh, met a girl in the middle of January of 1966, and we started courting, and the last weekend in May of 1967, she and I were married in a living room of a used car salesman in Durant, Oklahoma. And we're still married. <laughs> uh, if we make it to the 27th of this month, we're going to be married 48 years. Uh, so if you think about getting married, and you really want to go get go have a wedding where you have a good chance of it sticking, we'll see if we can get a hold of that guy in Oklahoma. <laughs> yeah, he got a pretty good record uh, with us. And a guy I sponsored in Dallas for a number of years decided he wanted to get married and uh, he was going with a little girl there in the group and we carried him up to do around Oklahoma and find that old boy. And that's been 20 years. And they're still married. So this guy's got a good try record. Uh, I don't know what he's doing, but he's doing something right. Anyhow, uh, Sam and I got married, and we were married about six months. And like I said, I got in the car business, and I was the kind of guy that I was the first guy there every morning last guy to leave at night and worked 10 times harder than the guy next to me while I was there because I thought I had to. And I thought I had to. I didn't want anybody asking me any questions about my personal life because I lived a lot of days in shame. You don't hear that word much in AA. But it fits. Fits a guy like me. What I've done, I was ashamed of. And I didn't want anybody to know who I really was. And I found out in that business that if you produced, they didn't care who you were. Nobody asked you anything. And so I did, and hard work paid off. And the fall of 1967, I got promoted. Well, I'd already been promoted from the sales floor into management, but then I got promoted to the position of general sales manager of this dealership. And I thought I was really something. 
And if you were watching this, and you've been able to watch this, what you would have thought you were seeing was a young man, hard worker, full of ambition, reasonably intelligent, but really a go-getter. That's what you thought. That's what you thought you were looking at. But what you're actually looking at was a young guy who lived every day in fear that somebody would find out who he really was and what he had done. And the hard work paid off. Uh, let me run this real quick. Uh, six months or so we were married and I called Sam one Saturday evening. I said, we're at the close of business today. I'm going down and I named the place with a couple of guys and we're going to have a beer and I'll be home around 7, 7.30. Uh, could be as late as 8, but I'll probably be there at 7.30. And that was fine with her. And so we did. And I didn't come home. I didn't come home that night. As the first night, I didn't come home. And I never got, I never was on time. But I was, she knew I'd be home. And that night, I didn't come home. Somewhere around 9 o'clock the next morning, I wandered home. I, wandered up to the door. And I knew that on the other side of that door, there was going to be some questions that needed to get answered. And I was ready. Well, I opened the door and she wasn't there. And I went looking for her. I found her in the bedroom lying on the bed, fully clothed, shoes and all. And in this keen alcoholic mind of mine, I'm thinking, well, she's in bed. She hadn't been to bed. She'd been up all night. And she had this funny look on her face. And I looked in there and she looked at me. I looked at her and her and she didn't say a word. And I left the room and I went and came back in the room. And my thinking was to join her in bed. Never even realizing she wasn't in the bed. So I get in the bed, I get in the bed, under the covers. And she got off the bed. And when she got off the bed, she opened the drawer to her night table. And from that drawer, she extracted a 38 pistol. And then I began to watch her with much anticipation, as you might imagine. And I thought, well, now don't get panicked over this, that gun's not loaded, remember? And I remember that it, it was agreed that we could have the gun, but we wouldn't load it. My understanding of guns, they're not much use if they're not loaded. And the worst thing you do is pull an empty gun at somebody. And so she knew it wasn't loaded as well, so she reaches back in the drawer, takes out two rounds, pushes the lever, the wheel falls open, she slides those two rounds in there, closes it up, pulls the hammer back, lines one up with the firing pin, and now she's standing over this gun, pointed at me. And nobody said a word up to that. And my only thought was, one of us needs to create some kind of dialogue. <laughs> so I had a question, because I was confused, not about what was fixing to happen, but I got that. The two bullets puzzled me. And I think those things hold five or six. But anyhow, I raised my hand, I'm sure, to get permission to speak. And I said to her, can I ask you a question? She said, yeah. I said, why did you just put two bullets in the gun. She said, Larry, before I answer that, I got to tell you, I'm not going to live like this. 
and we're not going to live this way. And it was a lot more dialogue than that, but that's the gist of what she said. She said the reason for the two bullets is one is for you and the other one is for me because we're not going to live like this. What I've described to you is what alcoholism looked like in our house that Sunday morning. Because alcoholism has a look about it and sounds. And you flip the coin, recovery has a look about it and a sound as well. And in our home today, you find recovery. It's been many, many years since anybody cried in our house. It's been many, many years since anybody cursed anybody in our house. But not so that Sunday morning. First time Sam heard me tell that story, on the way home, she said, I need to tell you something. I said, I want to. She said, well, that's to do with that story you told. She said, I've never heard you tell that before. I said, well, what about it? And she said, well, I got to tell you the truth, Larry. I said, what's that? She said, the truth is, is I don't know one way to say this. She said, the truth is, I never intended to use my bullet. <laughs> And we call that ego deflation at death. We can roll five years forward. The job's gone, the car's gone, the house is gone. It's all gone. There's me and her and a toddler named Lori, our little girl, who's not quite two years old. A Sunday night, and I'd just been fired from another job. And I'm laying in the floor on my back. Didn't know how I got there. She years a few years ago she she told me. I got there like anybody else would get there. I fell. And she didn't pick me up. And I remember I looked at her and I repeated her words back to her. And I said, I can't live like this in life. Would you please find me some help? She said, who do I call? And the TV's on. I don't know if you ever noticed this, but it seems like TV's always on in the drunk's house. Uh, it was on at our house that night, thank God. And on the TV screen was a probably a 20 or 30 second commercial for a little place called Center Hospital. And it just said Center Hospital for the treatment of alcoholism. If you have a problem with alcohol, call this number. And so I said, well, go call those people. And so she did. And so here we are. Here we are, some little over 42 and a half years later. Here we are. Because God, this is my belief, believe what you want to believe, intervened in our life that night. I said enough. And he took care of the rest. You know, God just said, when I was talking to one of my guys I was sponsoring today about God letting us run on our own free will. The kind and loving God that let us run on our own free will. And when we are ready to holler, enough, it's like someone says, turn around. And you turn around. And there he is. And I think that God was all over that scene that night. She made a call. We checked me into that place. 
I stayed the required number of days. I met Alcoholics Anonymous while I was there. I started going to meetings, and I absolutely loved my first nine or ten months in AA. Oh, what a wonderful time. I mean, you talk cloud nine, ten, eleven, twelve, I don't know what cloud I was on, but man, I was on some kind of cloud. How on recovery? You know, I didn't recover evident, but I was high on it. I remember her saying to me, shouldn't you be doing something? And I said, doing something? Are you not paying attention? I got a volunteer at the central office. I called my sponsor. He really doesn't want me to. I read the book every day. I go to lots of meetings. I'm busy. She said, well, I maybe you get a job. <laughs> and kind of help out around here a little bit. I'll get a job. I'm in recovery. I got time to work. Uh, but I got the message. So we started the process of putting our lives back together. Uh, after two years sober, uh, God saw fit to open the door to this little gal down Rockingham, who I owed a tremendous amends to. And I contacted her, and she welcomed my amends and was forgiven. I thought when I did that, that I'd go to jail. I was ready to go to jail. I was so ready to go to jail that I sat down with my wife and our little girl and told them what I needed to do. And that if I did this, I may be absent for a period of time. And my wife looked at me and said, you do whatever you need to do. If you have to go away, not to worry. We'll be here when you get back. So any reason or excuse I had not to do it went out the window that day. The book says that sometimes in this amends process that others could be hurt. And I think that they were part of the others, not me. So we got that going. And so that amends process began. And it's, the amends have been made. The, I owed this woman nine years of back child support. It took nine years to get even with her. But I got even. I like being even, I like that. I like being current. I like staying current. I'm current today. I'm current with her. I'm current with my sponsor. I'm current with my kids. I like staying current. And then the reason, the way we got back over in this part of the country is in August of 2012, I turned the key in the door of my business for the last time. And in the summer of 2013, we loaded up a moving van and all, all our sticks and what few belongings we'd accumulated. It's really more than a few when you start moving. And moved to, to the foothills of the Blue Ridge Mountains. We live in South Carolina seven and a half miles from the North Carolina line. And we absolutely love it over there. And it was the right thing to do. Because I had obviously hadn't been there very long when this new illness came along. And my children have been more than a little bit supportive. And it was just, it was the right thing to do. You just know somehow down deep when it's right. And I think just as much so through a, your, my consciousness is I know when it ain't right. And I trust 
my instincts. And I think I've been able for over years to come to a place where I can trust my instincts is a direct result of being willing to do a few things some I didn't want to do and develop a relationship with the God of my understanding and a deal called Alcoholics Anonymous. Thank you.